If you were with us last week, you found out what the most important piece of equipment is to help you be more successful in the upcoming elk season. If you didn't, well, y'all, it's pretty simple. It's you. Next up on our series on investing in yourself as an elk hunter, we talk about investing in your elk hunting know-how, otherwise known as skill sets and abilities. And today, we break this into three different areas. Calling, elksmanship, and elk zone preparation. And trust me, y'all, their comfort zone is not going to match yours. Those topics, along with our Elk Bros shout outs, and more from our EBD series. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas coming to you from Spring, Texas. And from New Mexico, our elk hunting coaches, Joe Gillia and Leroy Chav Chavez. And none other than the <laughs> co-founder of the Venezuelan Mafia, <laughs> From Katy, Texas, Luis Gonzalez. Man, how, how did I get demoted? I got demoted all of a sudden. You hey, know? man, after, well, we had the after other last week. <laughs> no, dude, Manano was like, what? Yeah. No, I, mean, I mean, the way he hung in there, man, I mean, it was pretty evident. I had people writing letters in going, um, I think you guys got this stuff wrong, man. I, I it, it was good to hear the real leader. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, you you kidding me? Well, you won't be able to put that shirt on Manano either, man. You'll have to yeah. get him a triple X so he can get his big. You head. know, man. I w I've been trying to think. How do we make it to where we get them little translating words at the bottom? <laughs> you know, for me and Manano when we do these podcasts, man. It it works out great in YouTube, but then I don't know how to do that in a podcast. If people oh, don't understand. worry about it, man. I tell you what, if if people didn't get the real flavor of what we're doing between my backwoods redneck talk you know <laughs> mm -hmm. and me getting off the chain oh my gosh man and then chav comes in chav's like the word of wisdom oh no doubt it is <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> no doubt how's it going chav good yeah yeah Feeling better buddy yeah it's uh I'll, I'll feel better tomorrow <laughs> no doubt Hopefully, yeah yeah word comes out we'll be uh -huh. praying brother yeah so yeah so he's got he's got pet scan results coming in tomorrow got to go see the doctor everybody you know um you guys let's let's just uh, keep praying for that man good thoughts okay? and prayers absolutely All right hey, hey gilbert you. yes sir I, um i i wanted to tell you uh, uh one of our latest stories on our elk bros website reminded me of you and chaff so much man uh sean dawson now i think at the time he was in it's either north or south dakota i want to say south dakota him and his brother and two buddies went elk hunting in Montana for the first time last year. Day one of their hunt, this guy um, gets it done. And oh, wow. so there, there, there's a story on our website, y'all, uh, about this. And you, so you guys listening are going to have to go to the Elk Bros website and look for the story just one more try. But the part of it that reminded me of you and Chab is at the end of the story, after he gets done talking about how they got their elk, they talk about the fact that they were, they were uh, quartering the animal, packing the animal out. And his brother, Jason, yells, bear right oh my gosh right <laughs> yeah it's so but but he's like my brother my brother you got to understand my brother's that guy you know that one that's yeah. always yanking your chain and stuff like that yeah <laughs> he's like so he yells bear and we're all like yeah screw you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> whatever <laughs> so they get up to turn down the trail and a frigging grizzly oh is in front of oh, these guys no. man. man so 
they commence to scrambling trying to so it's kind of like all right if i have a pistol and it's right here no pistol they had bear spray but now they are looking for the bear spray and they back up and it's kind of like i don't know if you guys can envision but those muskox in alaska Mm -hmm. you know how they kind of round up when people are coming at them right so they get shoulder to shoulder in the ground and they're going I think they listen to your podcast, bro. Hey, bear. Going, hey, bear. Hey, bear. Hey, bear. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Wow. The, bear, the bear looks at him, you know, and here's these four guys shoulder to shoulder going, hey, bear, hey, bear, from the Leroy Chavis and Gilbert Ornella <laughs> school of, of bear scaring. You know? Right. <laughs> and the bear actually turns and starts to walk away. Stops, wow. turns back around, <laughs> looks one more time, and so they're like, "Hey, bear! Hey, bear!" <laughs> you know, hey, d- let me tell you what these these four boys from the Midwest were some bad son of a bucks, man, because they are there with packs of meat, a grizzly bear, no pistol in their hand, mm. faced up and scared the that bear off, predator. man. <laughs> wow. So oh, unbelievable. Wow. I'm going to say it like old Carl said it. It wasn't their day to die. <laughs> Straight up. That's all it was. Or that or that bear wasn't hungry. Oh, I'm, my I'm goodness. telling you. Wow. wow. I've been there, man. I felt that little tingling on the back of my neck knowing that I'm, I'm facing something that could literally eat me at any time it wants to. And I got this little feller next to me walking around with his hands thrown up in the air hollering hey bear hey bear and then he looks at me and goes you got to do it damn it go you know, you to do it now. i had no clue buddy i started doing it big and loud and you know me i can do big and loud but i'm telling you we we, uh, we jostled that, that little black bear compared to yeah i was gonna say oh, a, a bear is a bear right oh a bear yeah. is a bear but that, i mean a grizzly Oof, yeah that's, that's a thousand big pounds right there. man that's a big animal <laughs> 10 foot tall and oh, man you know i yeah, was I mean, just thinking though if beach. that bear would have gone and eaten that eaten that elk man he could have gone home and told his wife i had dinner and entertainment <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah i believe he could have kept all that elk too brother i mean no <laughs> scary, long he ain't getting oh on my me. goodness Ooh. man yeah but i just I hear they they are okay man and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a successful Absolutely. haunt too. Absolutely. That yeah, you gotta so check cool, out the photos man. and everything and the story. It was pretty cool because it was a big shout out to us when he sent the pictures because he said that on, on day one, and I don't want to give too much away, but sure. you know, on day one that they had actually gone thirteen miles and were about to give up and something special happened. So mm-hmm. that's pretty cool. We've been there, brother. Yes, sir. I wouldn't have killed my bull last year if we'd have give up. I mean, we were just, I mean, getting ready to pack it in. So oh, yeah. Good yeah. good job, Sean and Jason. Uh, we look. I look forward to reading the article and uh, getting a chuckle over you guys uh, using a, a page out of Gilbert and Chav's bear scaring <laughs> techniques. There you that's, go, That's man. all, Chav, I can tell you that. I just chimed in. That was it. I, I'm a quick learner. I'm a good student. Oh, look, I man, I, I, that's the first time I've ever heard, because you guys got to understand something. I've been with Chav several times when we have incurred a bear. Right. And mm-hmm. it's been something mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm, I'm in the front Chav's right behind me and this bear, like mm-hmm. uh, we're stalking in on this bear. I wanted to get a photo of you. Man. And, yes. and we started out at 60 yards. We moved into 40 yards. I'm in about 20, 18 yards. And that freaking bear just starts to, Oh, 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 taking his head side to side. And <laughs> literally Chav, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Right, man. How high <laughs> did that bear jump up there and grab that tree? Oh, he could have, he could have dunked a basketball with his head, even with a rim. Jumps wow. straight up in the air, turns around, grabs this limb and just starts ripping into rah, 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 like that, man. Ooh. I turned around to tell Chav, did you see that? Did Chav? <laughs> Chav is freaking <laughs> gone, man. Yeah, there was no hey bear, man. It was like, hey bear, there's uh, Joe. <laughs> hey man, we didn't have no time to do that, Joe. That sucker was on us like that, and man, he was yeah. coming. And he was a big old gnarly color face, brown, black. Oh my I goodness. mean, big sucker, like, you know, 400 pound one. I mean, he's he's coming in not, not happy because we're over there on that kill, dude. Yes, you know, sir. He is not happy with us. So, <laughs> hey, Joe, yeah, uh, j- just for everybody's clarification, um, 
where's the story exactly at? Is it the elkbros.com webpage? Sure, yeah, go to elkbros.com, and right on the front page is generally the last story. Uh, you can go up to the top up there, and, uh, and we have a section that's just for stories as well up there on the top. Is that the one called Just Talking? Yeah, just talking. You click on just talking, and you'll read. You'll be able to read all of our tips, all of our stories. Is this the uh, from, story called "Just One More Try"? Just one yeah. more try, bro. Yeah. Yep, yep. By That's Sean Dawson, right? So, Sean uh, you Dawson. guys go check it out. We'll do it, Joe. Well, Joe, you guys know what time it is. Uh, shout it's out, time shout for Elk Bro Shout, shout out. out. Shout out. Shout out. Show. These are shout outs. To just a few shout cities out. with the most listeners. Topping our charts this week. And we have an Elk Bros first, man. The awesome. top two listening cities are both from the great state of Wisconsin. Bring yeah. it on so up, Wisconsin. It's the first time we've had the top two from the same state, man. So, awesome. yeah, Wisconsin in the house, huge, man. Um, so, starting out with our first one for our top listening city, if you have trouble pronouncing their city's name, it's all good because the locals are just fine being referred to as the Mazo Maniacs. In 1882, the Ringling Brothers Classic and Comet Concert Company. Now say that one, Luis. Huh? Yeah. Did you get that? Good luck. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, mm -hmm. the, the Ringling Brothers Classic and Comet Concert Company, later known as the famous Ringling Brothers Circus, had its very first public performance here. In fact, the local movement arts center named after the city, has a circus arts camp for children where kids can take classes in low-flying trapeze, man. Also, before its controversial closure in 2016, this was real interesting, our top listening city was home to one of the most popular clothing-optional beaches in the country. And that Ooh. is in none other than Mazomani, Wisconsin. Yeah! Amazing, no, Joe. Wisconsin. Uh, Amazing. Look, if you would have given me that text to read, <laughs> he knows you don't you, love him no more. <laughs> you were gonna have so much fun in this podcast. <laughs> you know, it's a shoot, yeah. Luis. I mean, if you were real man about it, man, you'd do it just for the listeners' that, enjoyment. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we'll do it and then unleash because some of those words will actually be, uh, yeah. you know, interpreted as something else. <laughs> yeah, the it. the clothing <laughs> optional, right? Yeah. 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 That's right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, that guy must have been from Buck Florida. How do you Nicky. know? He was saying something about sunny beaches. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, 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 next yeah. up, guys, it was originally known in local native language as the place where pigeons are hunted. But for all us guys and gals that love driving what we call the roads, uh, that, that no one else in their right mind would ever drive on. Our next top listening city is where the four-wheel drive was born. Founded in 1909, it was the Badger Four-Wheel Drive Auto Company, a pioneering American company that developed and produced the first all-wheel drive vehicles right here in Clintonville, Wisconsin. And, and you said you know of this company. Get yeah, out of here. 1909. Get um, out of here. You know of this company. So Badger, Badger Four-Wheel Drive Auto Company was part of a four-wheel drive company that GM and a whole bunch of them uh, came after back in the day. And they still had Badger Four-Wheel Drives for a long time, Joe. Are you uh, serious, man? Yeah, the, the four-wheel – my uncle was uh, belonged to a club. And I, how I knew about Badger Four-Wheel Drive is they called it a, a, a C-10 Badger or a K-5 Badger. You know, so that's how they all uh, came to came to know. But Badger was the first one that built the, the uh, first so all wheel cool. drive. Yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. I learned so much because they had a huge impact in the First World War with with those either the First World War or the Second World War. I'm trying to remember which one. I think it was the First World War because they had the, you know, basically four wheel drive all terrain vehicle, man, that that's totally right. changed things out there. So, that's, yeah, they uh, had the real UTVs of the world. Right. Yeah. The Absolutely. first first prototypes of them, yeah, and I think cool. the Humvee came out of that, and a whole bunch of them. You know. All right, America's smallest forest, three hundred and forty-eight square feet, has only one tree. 
an eastern cottonwood that is over 302 years old and thought to be the oldest of its species in the eastern United States. The Baumville bon tree, outside our next stop listening city, began its life 33 years before George Washington was even born. And it's older than the birth of our nation as we know it. Newburgh, New York. Newburgh, New, New York, York in the house. New York. New York's in the New house. York. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, when I heard that this was one of the oldest trees in the United States at 302 years old, my, what my mind right away went, because we already talked about the sequoias, right? You know, I was yes. like, I don't know about that, man. But yeah, and so I got reading deeper into it, and it was of its species in the eastern United States. Species. Cause, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. those sequoias are like, you know, over 2,000 years that. old. Yeah, 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 yeah. thousands of yeah. years. Yeah, they're like Methuselah trees, man. Really? Yep. The next city was actually named after the river that the natives called Elk River. However, British traders translated it incorrectly, thinking that an elk was the European red deer. Today, this top listener city is a Canadian center for agriculture and oil distribution. And it is also known for having several female hockey teams, the Stars, the Skookums, and the Amazons. Uh, big shout out to Red Deer, Alberta. Canada. Alberta, Canada. Alberta, Canada in the house. Yes, sir. Red man, Deer. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, doggone, yeah, doggone British, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, take a look He'd at it. still be animal. speaking German if it wasn't for us, brother. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. Last but not least, our next top listening city gets its name from the Shawnee word for beautiful. But you can't think about Kansas without thinking about Dorothy and Oz. In fact, it's here that the Garmin Marathon takes place with over 4,300 participants from all 50 states and 10 different countries. And many of the fun runners in this race and the spectators are dressed as characters from, yep, you guessed it, the Wizard of Oz. Hmm. And this happens in Oleda, Kansas. I've been around Kansas quite a bit in Oilfield, but I don't believe I've ever been to Olathe, Kansas. Yeah, no. To, and all them up around Lincoln and all that, I mean. Garmin is, uh, that is their their center, <laughs> is right there in Olathe. And oh, really? So, yeah. So this okay. marathon was actually, it was kind of like the Wizard of Oz marathon before Garmin came in, and they just kind of kept the same theme going uh, that was happening with that. And this is this this marathon is actually a qualifier for the New York City marathon. So Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty big time, 4, man. 4,300 participants. That's a lot of people. 50 states and 10 different countries, man, all running for fun yep. and, and, uh, and doing Dorothy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Only Joe could figure that out. <laughs> uh, today's topic, y'all. Last week we talked about um, our whole thing was, guys, we were talking about how everybody is always trying to find that shortcut to invest in things. They invest in gear, invest in in all the things except for a lot of times what they should be investing in. That's the number one elk hunting killing tool, which is ourselves, right? So last week we kind of talked about, we, we talked about the first part this week. We're going to go into what that investment is. And what we're going to talk about is areas for you to invest your focus, your time, your energy and money in your elk hunting know-how your ability and skill sets. And, and like you said, Gilbert, we broke this down into three areas. And I'm going to just kind of mention the three areas so people know what we're talking about when we get there. The first one's real easy. It, it's about calling. Second one, we said elksmanship. <laughs> Everybody's like, what the heck is elksmanship, right? So elksmanship, guys, is woodsmanship or huntsman skills and abilities as they pertain to elk. Okay, uh, that's what that is. And then our last area is the. Did you elk make that word up, Joe. 
Hey, I, I think I got that. Uh, where did I get that from? Yes, I made the I like, workout, man. I, I, I like huh? it, man. I like yeah. it. Sounds like something I'd come up with for sure. Uh, hey, I mean, you know, you got to remember, Luis, I got a simple mind, bro, man. It only goes so far. So. Hey, hey, remember, I'm still learning, so I just need to know what's made up and what's actually real. <laughs> so, well, well, about 75% of what I say is made up. So right. we'll just keep guessing, man. And then the, the last area. The is damn sure real i can tell you that <laughs> yeah and the last one is the elk zone preparation and what we're talking about that is an elk's zone and when we talk about our comfort zone and an elk's comfort zone it's two different things y'all and so in order for you to get ready to hunt elk you have to take all of these different things and get outside of your comfort zone so that you are actually prepared because when, when things go to crap, you're only going to be able to fall back on what you prepared for, right? Okay, you're right. Only, only as good as the last thing that you've prepared yourself for. So Yeah, you're training. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's absolutely right. So those are the three areas that we're going to talk about. We're going to try to get through those, and we're going to try to get to a little bit on our EBD series in the end. So let's let's talk about how we can – how can, can these guys invest in their calling, in their focus, their time and energy? How can they in, invest those things in their money in elk calling? And I'm going to start this out this way. Is <clears throat> Last week I did some math with y'all, right? We were talking yeah. about gear, right? Everybody has a bow. Everybody has, you know, <laughs> camo, all that. So l let me ask you a question. What percentage of guys do you think are going into the elk woods in September with an elk call? 100%. You think it's 100%? Probably, I probably. Bet if you're hunting elk in archery season, it better be. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, you're just would, going out there. I would there say handicap. 50 or less, man, maybe. Handicap. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's think, got a hoochie mama, Joe. Yeah. I, I, I guarantee you probably 98%, 98.8 guys that go hunting elk in September have some type of call with them. Like you said, whether it's a hoochie mama, whether it's a diaphragm call, whether it's an external read or anything like that. It I don't mean they know how to use it, but I'm telling you, they'll have it with them. Exactly. Yeah, they'll, they'll so have it, but they won't know how to use it. Yeah, so that, that's my point. If we have 98% of the guys going out there, again, last week you talked about that. What is our average percentage of animals that are taken? In the archery season. 10%. 10%. Yeah. So if you have 98, almost 100% of the guys out in the woods with elk calls using these, then why are not 98% of the elk being killed out there, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it's exactly what you said, because their know-how is lacking, right? Mm -hmm. So here's where I'm going to hit you all in the face out there, man, is, <laughs> and here's, here's my question. If I were to ask you, what is the percentage of your time spent practicing your calling versus your shooting, what do you think that percentage would be? Now, okay, yeah, so before you answer that, yes, I know you may be hunting more than just elk, and yes, I know that there's other ways to get a shot at elk, but let me tell you what, y'all, I'm going to go back to this question here in a second, but I can tell you this. If people were to ask me my number one reason, I mean, you take a look at this past year. Take a look at our elk camp this past year. Were any of those elk killed in an ambush? No, right? Were any of those elk killed waiting out a water hole? No. Tree stand? No, right? Stalking? No. <clears throat> uh, I can tell you 100% of the elk taken in our camp were taken st strictly because we have the ability to call, Right? Now, yeah, we threw a decoy into the mix, but if we weren't talking the language, that decoy doesn't mean anything. So now I'm going to go back to this. And, and this is, guys, you don't have to answer this question, but I want this to be the eye-opener. Because when we talk about investing in yourself for success, I can tell you the percentage of guys that are going to go elk hunting, the percentage of time that they spend practicing their calling versus their shooting is a huge disparity. Yeah. I'm talking, I mean, you could probably go 90 to 10. You could probably mm. go 95 to 5, right? I might even go 98% to 2% on a lot of guys, right? And, and, uh, and I'll tell you the reason for that is, is when you practice shooting your bow, first of all, 
shooting a bow is just the coolest thing on freaking earth, right? It's fun, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. And and the thing is, you get to see results, man. You're seeing results in real time. But mm-hmm. when you're practicing your elk calling, uh, you got mama yelling at you. You got dogs howling, right, Chav? Huh? Mm-hmm. You're doing it for cats. You're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it right. The coyotes and the dogs will let you know. Oh man, you the got chav, you know. The chav just took a stab at me and said cats too. What the heck, man? What's going on? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Man, <laughs> check it out. Man. If the shoot <laughs> <laughs> but the only result you're getting is not necessarily a positive one, and you don't know how to gauge yourself, and you're not sure where you're at, and it's not. It, it's like I can tell you every athlete that I've ever worked with will work the things that they're good at 80% more than sure. they will the things they're not good at because mm-hmm. they feel success at it. So I, I really want to throw that out there because a lot of you guys are going to really only start working that elk call in that last month before you go out and then now you're just trying to learn how to operate the daggum thing, man. You're just trying to figure out how to get a sound out of it. And getting a sound is just like that 98.8% of the guys are going to be in the elk woods, man. You have everybody out there with a call, but you only have 5%, 8%, 10%, 13% out of a hunting unit that are going to actually bring home an animal. And it's going to be the same out of that group. It's going to be the same 8%, 10% guys that are doing it every year because they know how to use that call they know their know-how isn't lacking and it's not just about sound it's about comprehension as well what are you going to say bro well one of the things i want to say is i'm i'm a result oriented kind of guy it's part of my profession right um so at the end of the day i have to give myself something that is result oriented so for me You know, I go all year long. We elk hunt in September Mm -hmm. and, you know, have been very fortunate to be very successful. And then we come into deer season and, you know, I guide and all kinds of different things, take people hunting. Uh, I hunt for myself too, my son and I, my kid, my family. So we deer hunt all the way up to February. Sure. And then from February to first part of May, we're on the, we're on the middle of my skeeter somewhere fishing. My son's a, a uh, high school angler and stuff like that. So we're constantly moving from, from sport to sport or technique to technique. Right. Sure. So for me, May 1st, May 1st is the date I start everything for my preparation in moving forward with elk hunting. Right. So I start my, I start my training. I start calling. I start uh, investing in myself and my time because I know I've got everything else behind me. It's been a little bit different here than that last month because we've been shut down for this COVID-19. Right. Right. So I've been able to do a whole lot of that in a jump start, Right. Yeah. So, but for me, May 1st was when I got everything rolling. Plus I knew if I drew or not. Right. Sure. So, and for me, it's not really about drawing. I'm coming with hair, hair lips, the governor, I'm coming to elk camp. It don't matter. I'm going to be there helping, calling, gutting skinning it don't i'm gonna be there right so right uh at the end of the day though it helps me to set a time sure. and to set a goal that when i'm gonna start right because guys can procrastinate a long time if they if they're in a real fast-paced world right sure. which Luis and i set ourselves in every day it's a real fast-paced game that we play it's kind of <laughs> slow right now so we can we can but even at that said you work harder when things are really slow than when you do when it's wide open. Yeah. Um, so again, I just want our listeners to understand that it's okay if you're not working the whole year, but you got to set a time when you start investing in yourself before you go. And it needs to be before four weeks before you get on the mountain. Oh, absolutely. And, and you got to remember you have 10 years of elk hunting under your belt too. So I do. and, And with some of the best elk hunters and callers, in the world and i'm a sponge you only gotta show me but just a few times and i'm gonna pick it up right Right. and that's just the god-given gift that i have uh of not only gift a gab but man if i can see it once i can get pretty much get it done so at the end of the day our our listeners that are do-it-yourself guys that are 
drawn out for their first time or whatever, man, we just want you to know that you got to start early. You know, you can't just wait till the last minute. Well, and I, I, you know, we've always recommended if, you know, for me, for guys to have the best opportunity to be successful, I highly recommend using a diaphragm elk call for a lot of various reasons then small details are going to free your hands up and, and, and give you the ability to do things that you're not going to be able to do with an external. So what I want to tell a lot of guys is, and is give you hints on some of these things. I don't know if you're a gum chewer, if you're a smoker, if you're somebody that pops Tic Tacs or anything like that, but man, if you have an elk diaphragm call and it doesn't even have to be a great one, man, because if you keep it in your truck and it gets hot in your truck, it's not good for a diaphragm call. The worst thing for a, for a diaphragm call is heat. It just messes with the latex. But if you will just I, and it doesn't matter how great it is because you ain't going to be out necessarily talking in, in, to the elk. But if you keep one there, if you keep one uh, uh, someplace uh, like, you know, Gilbert, you said you're out on a fishing boat or you're in deer camp. You know, if you keep one of those and you just pop it in your mouth and instead of popping in that stick of gum or popping in that cigarette and you do things like try to do a tune. Try to do, you know, uh, I, I don't know, any kind of, uh, of tune, easy tune, you know, uh, with that so that you're practicing tongue and volume control. And I do it on my walks, Joe. You uh -huh. know, when I go on, uh, you know, I start out three to five days a week walking and then, you know, I get that into just about every day, you know, right. within within 60 days of coming to elk camp long five to seven miles right so i got a lot of time to use diaphragm call and man I, you know i'll wear a read out by the time sure. i'm done with all my workouts and everything but at the end of the day when i get to elk camp i'm be ready to rock and roll you know yeah and, 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 and i, and, I can and, at least do a little small cow call and i can do a location bugle you know, and those two things, man, I think are killer to have in your arsenal and can mean, you know, doom or despair to you uh, when you're out in the elk woods and, and you, you got it going on and you're so in the middle of an elk herd. The, the, the thing that I want to tell you is there's, there's the practice, there's the focus, time and energy that goes with the call, the physical calling part, even learning to do things like, Ugh. so, you know, when you're, when, you know, when you're just trying to, to change the sound of a call to add some of that voice inflection in there, just adding some of that growling or being able to take your lips and, and do kind of like a, you know, like a turkey call. Mm -hmm. And if you're turkey hunting, use that diaphragm call, man, while you're turkey. You and I use my elk diaphragm call to turkey hunt. So, so that's, the, good. that's the physical part of just with the actual call. The other part area that I want to talk about, though, to put that time and energy in, and this is where the money can go as well, is not just in the calling, but learning and studying what that conversation consists of. And I mean, you can get as shallow and as deep down as you want to in this. I mean, you can go all the way from, uh, you know, guys that are just on the hill, just, just screaming challenges all the way down to Chris Rowe that are going to tell you, you know, what each syllable is. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you've listened to Chris Rowe, Luis, right? Yes, mm -hmm. sir. I have. Yeah. And I mean, and, 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 I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much, but like, like we mentioned on the previous podcast, right. I mean, it's different styles of learning and that's why I would recommend you go and listen to, you know, as many as you can and put your fingers on as much as you can, because then there's something that's going to click with your style of learning and, and that's what you should stick with, you know? And, and so, yeah, he, you know, he worked for me. And, and I want to, and I want to go back to something that we talked out about in a previous podcast with you as well, Luis, is that when you first came to the United States, you were able to say uh, certain sentences in English or sing certain songs in English without even knowing what they meant. And, mm -hmm. That's right. uh, and you can do the same thing, you know, by, I mean, you can go to YouTube and you can go Rocky Mountain yeah. Elk and you can pull them up and you can hear them talk and you try to reproduce the same sound. You yes. put your time and energy into that. And then because you're able to produce them, you can later then have them explained as to what they are and then, and then realize when the right time is and what that conversation is and where you can go with yeah. that, you know? That's, so, that's a perfect explanation, uh, Joe, I think. I 100% agree because even before going into the more detailed type of schools of how to call, 
I was actually just doing exactly that. I would go to YouTube, uh, would make sure that, uh, you know, pick up a, you know, say elks bugling or elk scow calls and stuff like that and start listening to the sounds, just getting the sounds familiar in my head because you have to have it in your head clear what the sound sounds like in order for you to be able to start reproducing that sound and right. then matching it to where it's, what it sounds like in your head. Otherwise, if you don't know what you're trying to imitate, you're, you're just making sounds that are not ever going to match what they sound like, if that here's, makes sense. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Here's, where the, <laughs> here's where the money comes in, mm -hmm. and it, doesn't, it, it yeah. can be as little bit of money or as much as you want to. I mean, it could be from buying an app, like uh, the um, Palmadel's Elk Nut app, uh, all the way to, I mean, Good you can app. go to Michael Batiste and become of his part of his Elk Calling Academy. There's people out there that'll give you one-on-one -on -one lessons to, uh, uh, and, you know, you take Chav, for example. Chav can't do what you do, Luis, as far as just listening to a whole herd of elk talk. Chav doesn't want that. Chav wants that one sound over and over again so he can hear himself it, i think that's what you said to me chap and that how yeah the, the more often i hear a sound the easier it is for me to duplicate it that's right so uh i'm the same way chap yeah need so I, I need to listen to it over and over and over and then tape myself and and see how that sounds right see how i'm getting there and once you do it enough you get the feel of where to place your tongue and and even where to place the reed in your uh, in your palate. So right. yeah, that that that's what works for me. And right, like I said different things work for different people. So uh, you know, try but different you, venues or avenues. If you don't invest that time and energy, you're not going to find that out. You're going to be somebody that's going to be frustrated. And and I'm always hearing from people, how do we simplify this? And 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 I'm trying to give you the simplification without telling you, and, and it's hard because a lot of times, you know, we, we've even said it, you can go learn a good cow call, you can learn a good location bugle, and, and you can still call an elk, but you're going to be somewhat limited, all right? You can do it, man, but you're going to be somewhat limited. But what I'm telling you is if you can do a location bugle and you can do a cow call, then you can do just about any type of cow call by giving it more length, more volume, less volume, give it some voice inflection, or the same thing with a bugle. It's just about that intensity. And, and you guys hear us say this all the time, and people are like, what the heck do you mean by emotion? Well, mm. and I, Luis has, has asked me that question, right? What do yes, you mean sir. by emotion? Mm -hmm. So it's real easy. You guys hear my voice right now, and you can tell that I'm excited by the way that I'm, I'm, I'm using my voice right now. You can, you can hear that. But if I'm like, you know, yeah, it's real good to see you guys this evening. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I hope we have a, a good podcast. And, and But if I tell them, what the heck are you doing? Let's get out of this. Let's go for it, man. I mean, you guys feel yeah. that emotion, right? And it's yeah. no yeah, different, it's different in the elk world, man. When you have a, a, you have mm -hmm. a bull elk that's... And then all of a sudden he's like, I mean, screaming in your face. You hear that, yeah. that rawr, rawr, noise inside yeah. of it. You can tell that sucker is pissed off. He's adding that emotion. Yeah. So, guys, when we talk oh. about emotion, that's what we're talking about. And you can get it a lot of times by adding. And when I say intensity, uh, you can equate intensity with air of, amount of volume, not level of 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 noise volume, but the amount of volume coming out of your lungs, that intensity that hits that reed is going to crank that sucker and it's going to rip it up really, really hard and quick and, and raise it up. Yeah, we call those bulls growler bulls, man. Oh, yeah. They've got that real gravel in them and at the end of their bugle, you know, and they'll growl. And uh, it's, it's definitely, you can tell when they're just doing the location bugle and stuff like that. And then when you get them lathered up, they'll get that growl in there. Yeah. At the end. And it's, it's definitely, they're agitated. One of the things I want to talk about, Joe, those, we, we hit a lot on diaphragm calls, right? A lot of guys just can't, they just can't get it in there, man. They, they, it gags them. Uh, they're just a, a mental block with them being able to use it. There sure. are some very good, uh, Handheld external uh, mouth reads, external mouth uh -huh. reads, right? Yeah, I mean, real good. 
I mean, that make it the bull crazy call is sure. really good. But Primo's, that call is going to be limited to what that call can do is the only yes. thing I'm saying, right? No doubt. Now, I no have doubt. seen guys that will hang five calls around their neck and do just great with yeah. it because they can change yeah. it up. That's a fact as well. And, I, and I'm not going away from it because I tell you, man, uh, you know, some of those uh, native by Carlton calls and and like you said, uh, the, what was the name of that call you just you just put out make there? It make a it a bull, bull, cra- make it yeah, a bull crazy. Yeah, that one there, some of the primos calls. Some There's mm-hmm. some incredible externals out there. But again, mm-hmm. if you – That Car- one, Carlson was a hyper call or a hyper, hyper something. I remember RC used a hyper hot. bunch. Mm-hmm. Hyper yeah. hot, that's yeah. it. And, man, that thing is deadly yeah. uh, well, when and it's, it's, it's the right it's, time. They used to sell that under the gimmick of an estrus buzz and, you know, mm-hmm. really just that insistent cow elk call. But, mm-hmm. you know, if, if guys get good at those and know how to switch from one yeah. to the other – and know when to do it, mm-hmm. that's the key. Like you said before, it, it's not so much the how, it, it's the why and the when, right? Right. Okay. Right. That you're doing. Yeah, I have a little flex tone call that you just bite down on it and you produce air through it. And man, it's one of the best sounding little cow calls I've ever seen in my life. Y- I mean, you know, it, it looks like an antler, a piece of antler, and you bite down on it. Right. And I mean, it is awesome. I, I don't I, I usually have that right here on my desk here, man. I was looking for it, but those flex mark calls yes. uh, that I bought for you guys. In fact, uh, I, I've got that in a patch. I need to. Here we go. I've got that in a patch. I need to ship off to you. That flex mark call right there, man, is just dynamite for a cow call. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just super sweet. It, it it does a great job. Like, but, I just want our listeners to know there's other pieces sure. of equipment out there other than a diaphragm, right? Some guys just can't get past that. That having that thing and then, you know, they choking on it and gagging on it and stuff like, I mean, I know, you know, our, the Pennsylvania cat man himself, Brendan right. Houlihan, he has a real tough time with that working. Now he's working to try to get past all that. Just ask Chav, man. Right. Same, same. Right, Chav? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It took a while. Uh, when I first started, you know, just tickled the palate and just yeah. couldn't use it. And right. I've gotten used to it now, you know, trim it yeah. a certain way and it fits yeah. a lot better and, you know? I, I truly believe, I truly believe that if you find the right diaphragm call that fits your palate, anybody can do this. And, uh, but, but again, I, you know, it's something that I've been doing for a long time. Mm-hmm. But again, Gilbert, what I want to go back to, though, man, is saying that's still the physical call itself. No doubt. Practicing no doubt. that. got to learn how to use it. For that sure. time and energy in knowing how and when and why you're doing it is so critical. Mm -hmm. And if it comes down to the money part of you investing in either getting a coach or taking a course or um, getting somebody personal to do it or buying an app, it is going to be money that is going to come back tenfold. Because I got news for you, y'all. Y'all can buy a doggone $1,500 bow and you can shoot aces, man. I mean, you can just Robin Hood all day long but ain't gonna do you no good if you ain't got a critter in front of you. <clears throat> You're right about that, Joe. And I've seen guys that could do that, and they still couldn't get it done. <laughs> it, it is just different. I just gotta tell you guys, having that <clears throat> thousand pound animal in front of you is intimidating, mm-hmm. and you gotta be ready. And you know, it's part. I think it's ninety five percent mental. Uh, you really gotta have your mental game ready, uh, and then. You know, you got to invest in yourself mentally, physically, and then use your tools. And that's coming that you next have. week. Mental and physical right. stuff coming mm-hmm. next week. And for, and for those of you who have not done it before, um, man, go try it. Uh, your your yeah. thoughts on calling uh, an animal like this, like Gilbert said, uh, will will change you forever, and change will change the way you approach your learning towards calling because. Mm-hmm. It's an unbelievable experience. It's, and, uh, it's nothing like it. I had somebody that uh, uh, I was just talking uh, with Guy from Western Contours uh, yesterday. And, you know, guys like, you know, because I was talking about the fact that everybody always wants to scream a bull in. They always want to do a challenge and have that bull coming in, just, you know, throwing snot, screaming at you and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because he, as he described it, that's the sexy. You know, that's, that's just what everybody dreams of doing. And, and just understand that, that that particular call and that particular strategy is only one part, man. If you guys would actually 
again, spend that time and energy, get that focus on that because if anything is going to change your odds in your favor to create your own opportunities, it is speak the language. That's no what's doubt. going to do it. Okay? No doubt. And, and, and to add to that, that screaming a bull in, being sexy and everything's only going to work in a few scenarios. You're if absolutely you're not right. In that, if you're not in that scenario and you try to make it work, you'll blow him up and you exactly. won't ever see him. So you got to really understand when that scenario is going to play out. And that's just by you understand, learning how to speak the language. And I got to tell you, I didn't go to YouTube. I didn't go to, uh, you know, look up these apps and stuff. I, I am now I'm doing that more and more, but I sat behind one of the best elk callers for the last 10 years and, and got it firsthand out of the, you know, out of the preacher's mouth. And uh, that's how I learned it. Right. And I've been that way my whole, my whole life. You know, if I can see it, I can do it. If I can hear it, I can probably imitate it. At the end of the day, it's how you got to learn guys. And, and no, no one thing is right for everybody. Uh, you know, Luis is totally different the way he learns and set things up than I do. The premise is the same. We're all looking to get the same goal and achieve the same uh, end end result. But at the end of the day, we, we learn differently. But it's like Joe said, it's about setting up everything with our focus, our time and energy and putting our money in ourselves. And the further away your learning curve is the more time you need to put in it. As, Absolutely. Yeah. As you get experience in that, um, I'm not going to say you need to get lazy on it or get satisfied mm. on it because you can become, go from being a, a, an okay caller to a good caller, from a good caller to a great caller, man. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I'm telling you, when you have that ability to change and create your own situation out there, it alters everything. Trust me on that, man. I'm it's the reason you. why we're more successful than the 98% guys, right. right? Or the 90% guys. It is 100% the reason why we're most successful year in and year out. Uh, it I ain't totally a magic thing about where we hunt. It ain't a magic thing about, who, you know, uh, what we're wearing or what bow we're shooting. It's 100% being able to speak the language and getting in the middle of it and making sure we understand the situation and closing the deal. There you go. And and that's going to take us right to our next one. The next part is our elksmanship, man, that that woodsmanship or huntsman skills and abilities that pertain to elk investing um, in using your focus, time and energy and your money in that area. And, and I'm just going to tell you, um, we're going to talk about some of these things in here. And what I want in the back of your mind, like when you say, okay, all right, I can understand the focus and I can understand the time and energy. And we're kind of, kind of break that down as we go. But where does the money come in? Well, the money comes in. There's something that a lot of us don't get very often anymore. And that's a thing called a book. You know, there's, there's, <laughs> yeah. some, there's some great ones out there. There's some incredible magazines that always have little tips and tricks to help you that uh, I can remember as a kid, man, outdoor life always had these, these woodsmanship type little clips and stuff that would help you out. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, like Gilbert says, man, attach yourself to a mentor and it, it, <laughs> whether it's somebody that's close to you, somebody that's far away, if you have and you can connect in and you can have conversation, they're willing to do that, man, do that. Camping trips. Now, when we start talking about elksmanship, I'm going to tell you that a big part of that is is just flat woodsmanship. And to improve that, you just got to get in the woods. And that doesn't mean you have to be in the western woods, man. I grew up in the swamps and the backwoods of the Carolinas. And that was my school. And that was my school that got me to kill my first elk without any knowledge of the animal just because I knew how to hunt. So the more time that you spend in the woods, understanding the environment and getting comfortable in that, uh, you know, understanding just uh, the, the flow of, of the country out there, the, the feel of the elements that are around you, understanding the way the winds are, the thermals are, um, understanding, you know, just how the movement of the forest is and at certain times of the day. You know, it, it, it means so much. So those camping trips and those visits at home, hunting small game, mm -hmm. you know, Dagon Luis and Manano and Gilbert, 
I mean, me and Chad, we just shake our heads sometimes, huh, Chad? I mean, it's like <laughs> these guys, these yeah. guys in their hunt. Yeah, we're huh? in the woods. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I was in the woods last weekend, you know. I mean, we were working most of the time, but I, we ended up, you know, shooting a coyote. And uh, I mean, we, we're always going to turn it into something that we can stalk or something like that. My son, he loves to do it. So we were up working, filling feeders, getting ready for the next deer season. And we're always doing something. We're either going to be on the boat fishing or hunting. Oh, man. You it, know, our, it, boy, our boy, Venezuelan Mafia boys, they're going to be in there chasing the runnels, uh, chasing those pigs. They love to do it. So, oh, uh, yeah. And they're, they're, like I said, you want to challenge yourself? Come on down here. Texas getting you some of these little swine out here, buddy. I uh, promise you, they'll humble you. You know, we've always oh, said critter. that when you're hunting elk, um, after you get your first one, it gets easier. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you this. And, and, and you know, Gilbert, you came out, and I remember the first year you told me, man, I hunt whitetail. I stack them things up, boom, 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 like that, you know. Well, it, it was different when you went to go shoot an elk for the first time. Oh, my God. But – but I still think just that interaction, you guys getting up on pigs and being able to pick a spot and to be able to take those animals, that is huge when it comes to taking any kind of animal because double lung in an animal, two holes is two holes. No matter whether it's a mouse or an elephant or a, or a bugling bull, man, it's, it's two holes. So uh, I, I think that goes real far. I mean, using your money for seminars. Y'all, every year in your state, there are all kinds of outdoor um, uh, expos that occur with seminars that go on. And you'll know which ones that you can go to just by talking to people and find what fits you. You don't, you don't have to go in and stargaze. You just got to go in because you're wanting to go in and learn about an animal. And, and you look at it that way. And if you pick up one thing, you're going to be doing good. Go to YouTube, take an online course, uh, you know, we've got uh, Corey Jacobson has tremendous assets out there. Our ours is, you know, we're working real hard on ours. Hey, uh, uh, newsflash: Go to YouTube at ElkBros dot com and check out our podcast, our past podcasts. All of them are full of unbelievable call. The last ones we did with calling our shot placement, uh, our shot placement YouTube is one of the best I've ever seen. It costs absolutely zero guys to go and put that in your pocket. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm not pimping what we're doing, but it's, it's exquisite. The pimp, of, man, pimp. Yeah, it is <laughs> believably exquisite. The amount of information that Joe and his team uh, that we've been able to bring to you guys in just under a year, uh, but it is well worth you guys going back to episode one and, you know, bear with us a little bit. We were, you know, episode one through five, we were getting our feet under us. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're getting better at this every day. Uh, but I'm telling you, it is the best elk hunting content you're ever going to listen to. And you and, know, and uh, real yeah. quick, real quick, Joe, um, uh -huh. in order to get there, the easiest way to do it, you just go to YouTube and on the search on top, just type elk bro elk bros and then uh this option is going to pop up first and then you're just going to click there and that's uh, it's actually probably going to give you an option to subscribe right away and you can subscribe there too and get notifications yeah man and i tell you what go to, go look at any comment on there and we respond to any comment on there so um at three or four this week that i responded to yeah, it, it just it's 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 a, a good way to go. And you know, guys, when when we talk about you know, we've got I had a guy just tell me today, he's like, Joe man, I can't believe all the info you guys give out for free. And and I told him for now, because you know, we've we've got some <laughs> stuff we're hoping that guys are gonna want to pay for. Sure. Um but you know, uh, that's <laughs> this has been about our relationship with y'all out there. It's been about us being coaches and all we know how to do is coach, man. There's times, I got news for y'all listening out there. There's times Gilbert looks at me and goes, what are you doing? Don't be saying that, man. Don't be giving that away. <laughs> but it's all good, yeah, right, bro? I have to call him off the air and go, dude, what are we doing here? Uh, you know, you know how long it took us to figure that out? You, you know, it was probably never intended, you know, part of the thing is like in the calling, me actually doing some actual calling. Most of our listeners had never heard us call until we did this like solo series because the calling part of it was strictly going to be in our academy. And, uh, it, you know, um, 
our gift to y'all. It's from us as a coaching group uh, wanting you to get better. I think if you believe in us and, and you – um, and there's going to be a lot of people out there still that you guys are going to be able to say and tell them, look, man, you guys want to learn something. Well, you know, these guys just finished their blue collar elk Academy, go pay for that subscription and learn something. So, you know, yeah. that that's going to happen and it's going to come in its time until then just keep on rocking with us. Okay. But I, I'm telling you, Corey Jacobson has one done, man. And, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, and I'm a, not knocking none of those guys, man. No. I'm just telling you about the free content, right? Yeah, Here, absolutely, I'll, I'll, man. I'll take the Pepsi challenge with all them boys. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I mean, we, we have produced some quality stuff. And, you know, it well, goes right that, into I, I'd take the Pepsi. Say that again. I'll take the <laughs> Pepsi challenge with all them guys. That's right? pretty cool. I hadn't so, thought about that, man. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, it's about investing in yourself. And this content that we've got, you know, like I said, almost a year running, it's it's exquisite. And so, guys, like when we, when we talk about our area of, of elksmanship, man, you know, we did a podcast called Being the Gutsy Hunter. And, and we mean just that is that um, and this will take both money focused all the above money focus and time i'm telling you number one get on x get google earth on your computer get a compass all right and then when you have that learn to use those tools and go out in the woods like i just told you i don't care if it's your neighborhood woods i don't care if it's halfway across the county take that on x um do a little bit of study of the area with Google Earth, get used to doing some, a little bit of e-scouting. And one thing you're going to find out immediately is that those little things that are called topo lines that make it look like, I mean, you can look at them and go, oh, they're not too close. That can't be too steep. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what, yeah. things are always steeper than what those topo they lines see, look yeah. like, man. And, yeah, there uh, should be a disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just go get out in the woods. Learn to use that. Start playing games with your kids. Teach them how to use a GPS. Go hide. Buy them a, a – I mean, if your kids are into hunting and they get a new bow, don't you give that bow to them, man. You go put that bow out in the woods, get a GPS uh, a idea, waypoint Joe. on them, and make them go find that thing, That's man. That's an awesome idea. Yeah, oh. look, you, you know, Joe, one of the things – I've been hunting with my kids since they they were four and five years old. Mm -hmm. So if I got hurt while I was out in the woods, yep. they needed to figure out how to get help for dad. Excellent. So one of yep. the first things I taught them is I kept a card, a three by five note card in my mm -hmm. backpack. And it had the exact coordinates to our camp. Right. on that, that they could read off and, it, and how to get in touch with 911 on my cell phone. They right. all knew how to use my cell phone. They all could give directions directly to our camp and read off of that, off of that card. So it was real important for me to set things up to where if I got hurt, they could at least get me help. Right. Right. Or right. they could get themselves help if I'm, you know, mortally right. wounded or whatever. Right. So yeah. at the end of the day, it's about preparing, right. And about, sure taking, taking things. I mean, look, when you're in the woods, in the Western woods, it's really important that you understand that, look, when it gets dark, it's going to get really cold. Yeah. Right? And, and we're not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to rehash it all over right. again, but I can tell you a lot of guys will stick to trails. They're going to stick to those known areas strictly because there's a fear factor and you learn That's to right. overcome that by being comfortable in the woods, yeah. you know, getting out there, going into the woods in the dark, whether you're squirrel hunting as a kid, you had to go into those swamps, go way into them in the dark, sneak in, sit by a tree, wait for it to come daylight, you know, to do that hunting. And that kind of stuff just teaches you how to be comfortable out there. So get in the woods, do your fitness walks in the woods. Take your equipment with you and do your equipment test. Wear your packs, wear your boots, wear your gloves. Find out where your failure points are, man. Okay? And, Shoot and with guys, a decoy on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Smart butt, man. <laughs> and, you know, you get out there. The, the thing that you need to do, and here's the biggest thing, and we're actually going to talk about more of this here in a second is is and and i'll throw it in right now is is sensory awareness so when you're out there in the woods for that woodsmanship learn to see and not just look 
See what is around you, mental pictures, landmarks, trees that look a certain way. Turn around and look from where you came from. Absolutely. There's places that you go through that you'll smell. Like um, there'll be strong smells of what me and Chab call anise. There's like a licorice smell. Licorice. And we'll go through an area where we smell that really strong or a certain flower or a, a dead dying uh, mushroom type smell. You know, you, you can register all that stuff because – Sensory awareness is something that you guys really need to reteach yourself. It takes focus, takes no money, and it and it doesn't really take a whole lot of time. It takes focus to reteach yourself because we have been taught to do just the opposite. I mean, we have our eyes open, but are we really seeing things? Are we paying attention to detail? Are we looking at something and going, okay, I know where that is and it's this way. This is how it looks at this time of day. How's it going to look at the end of the day? You know, uh, when I go back and I look behind me and I can see particular rocks or landmarks from from that position. Well, that's how I'm going to go back, right? So I really need to do that stuff. So, you know, really change your whole awareness. You know, we're breathing, but are we really smelling? You know, I, I mean, I've had guys that, that will go through and we're walking in the woods and I go, do you smell that? And they're like, what? I'm like, that smell, man. You smell that smell? That's an elk. What mm -hmm. smell? You know, mm -hmm. and you explain to them like, oh yeah, man, because in our society today, we put deodorant on, we put perfume because we're trying to cover smells. We don't want to smell certain things. Uh, Manano be one of them for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Root. Root. <laughs> but, but Joe, uh, you know, you, you've got a, a super interesting point. And actually this past weekend, uh, Rafa and I went uh, to Somerville, which is, you know, one of the uh, public lands around here, uh, around here. And we were kind of hunting for pigs. And, and it's interesting because I'm always like, you know, usually up in the front, you just kind of, you know, following a trail or guiding the way and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. and this time I actually told him, I said, Hey, why don't you go in front this time and I'll just follow you and you just go ahead and, and they start kind of leading, leading the way and just decide where to take us. This is the that path that I want to follow. And this is where I want to go. And, uh, this is the area I want to explore, but you know, I'll let you, I'll let you guide it. And, Man, it was super cool because um, at the end of the day, Rafa actually told me, he's like, man, I wish you'd be inside my head to actually be able to see the difference in how I understood Somerville before this trip and how I understand it now just simply right. by having the difference, the different experience of being in the front and actually being having to be aware of where we're going and where things are and all that. He was stuff. no longer so, a passenger. He was right, active. Right, engaged. Right. So important, important to keep that in mind too. You know, that, that, you know, if you're actually in the front, actually making your own way, it will expedite that learning curve too. You know, and I, I want to, you know, that's where I would tell guys, man, remember, you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? So if there's three of us and, and we're in a group hunting and everybody's dependent on Joe to be able to smell, see, hear, well, mm -hmm. we know I ain't going to hear everything, right? So, right, right. <laughs> you know, uh, if if all of us, all three are using our our awareness our sensory awareness, we are so much stronger because somebody might pick up something that I didn't smell or that I didn't see or that I didn't hear. Definitely that I didn't hear, right? That's going to mm -hmm. happen. So, uh, and, and I tell people, you hear sounds, but how often do you listen? You know, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, how often are you listening for those crows crying, a cro calling a whole that's, bunch? That I mean, squirrel chattering at squirrel that crib, chattering. man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a squirrel lets you know that something is in his in house. the woods, yep. It, you yep. know, this is my house, brother, and we're letting all the other squirrels know that there's something in our house up here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't tell you how many deer I've killed. That's how we my used grandpa, to hunt deer, man. Yeah, my grandpa keyed me in on that when I was just a wee little lad. He said, yeah. when you hear that squirrel chatter, get your gun up, and get it ready, because something's coming. You know, and he's always it's been right a thousand times, you know. Yeah, and when the woods get quiet, mm -hmm. Oh, you know, oh, you yeah. got birds chirping and everything like that. All of a sudden, yeah. the woods get quiet. Mm -hmm. Something is up, man. You yeah. had better be paying attention to your the sick. The apex predators oh, are out yes, and sir. about. 
something is getting ready to happen there. So uh, I'm just telling you, man, that sensory awareness is something to focus on. I mean, when you walk around and you smell cigarette smoke, man, know which direction that wind is coming from and look in that direction and find that person smoking that cigarette. That there is training, man. Yeah. It's training. When you catch a different smell, when you hear a different noise, identify that noise. What's causing that noise? What could be doing that? What direction is that coming from? You know, and you just, that's what I'm just telling you. Be that active participant. When One you of the things, uh, Joe, that I, I try to do too uh, when I'm out in the woods is every once in a while I try to stop uh, and just listen for a few seconds and take a couple of deep breaths just to kind of try to pick up any smell and then just right. see if I can hear anything. Because sometimes you're just walking and then your ear, your hearing gets used to your, the noise that you're making as you're walking. So every once in a while, I, I quite yeah. often stop when I'm on the heels of Joe because, you know, I just can't <laughs> freaking <your> breathe anymore. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm jerking him back. <gasps> Well, Chad, I get you though, brother, for sure. Yeah, Chad, when we when we started out, bud, man, and you used to do a lot on your own. You didn't call necessarily, but you know, like Gilbert has has said in the past, you used your woodsmanship. Oh, he's amazing so, in the woods, you know, dude. And when we talk about that, you know, when we talk about awareness, Chad, it, it makes finding and understanding elk signs so much easier when you are aware about that. What? What was what was your mental awareness? What when you were out in the woods? What was your thought process in order to get on elk? Well, I think uh, you know uh, the the most basic one and probably the most important is is the wind. You know, if you walk into the wind long enough, you're going to run into an elk. You know, uh, but of course, you know, like you just mentioned before, listening to uh, squirrels, chipmunks, uh, and walking into the wind. Uh, you know when you're approaching something or when something's approaching you. And a lot of times I would catch them unaware that, you know, that I was there. You know, I'd actually walk up on, on some elk that were bedded down. You know, I could see the, and if you're observing, you know, looking around, uh, you know, I actually saw the antlers, you know, moving. Hmm. Right. And, yeah, or an ear flicker. Yeah. Or something. I go, oh, that. that? Tail you know? swish. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I've been with him a thousand times and we're easing along whoa, 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 whoa. and I look and he's like, I saw something right up there. I seriously. And I'm like, Hmm, okay. And I get to look and I'm like, yeah, that's an elk, man. You know, he just, he knows what they, those shapes look like. Not to mention you guys have been hunting an area for 30 years. You know, right. y'all know every grain and sand that's in that son of a gun. So at the end of the day, he understands in that wind direction too, what usually the elk are going to be doing. You know, that's huge, man. That woodsmanship is way big. I think we don't give it enough, uh, enough credit, credit uh, of how successful you can become because of your woodsmanship or elksmanship. Right. Right. Uh, right. I think I, I, uh, I, one thing I've noticed with, with Gilbert and maybe it comes from hunting whitetail or hunting year round. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, is the fact that he's got some amazing eyes, you know, he'll say there's, oh, a, I go, Manano what? and Luis, I know, Manano yeah. and Luis are just like, they're on it, man. I mean, they're uh, so aware uh, visually. Yeah. You know? Manano, Manano is incredible. Manano's oh. eyes and ears too. Uh, he's got, yeah, he's got a gift there for sure. Yeah. I, I just to have a, a real good eye at picking out movement and picking right. out, uh, something that wasn't there just then, you know, I, I, Joe and I specifically have seen it happen uh, when I was with Joe, we walked right into the middle of an elk herd and neither one of us really un, uh, knew we were doing it until I looked up and I grabbed him by the back of the pack and I said, yo man, uh, it's pretty dark. Oh, we were in the gray light too, yeah. right? I mean, we were like, it was dark, man. It's, it's pretty dark, Joe, but I'm pretty, and I'm not real good anymore at seeing in the dark. I'm like, uh, Joe, I think that's an elk looking at us right there. He <laughs> digs in his backpack and he's like, "Give me my, give me my binoculars out." So I get him his binoculars. This these elk are standing there looking at us, and he puts his binoculars up and he looks at me and he goes, "It is an elk." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, "All right, buddy, here we go." And we killed, we killed an elk in that set. Right? Oh man, yeah, yeah. I, that's I, I got to dogpile you that day. That was pretty yeah, cool, it was man. A lot of fun. And, uh, 
You know, and one thing as far as the money part of it is investing in that elksmanship and woodsmanship and, and being able to understand and find elk sign, you know, is if you can at all possible do it is give yourself more time at the front end of your hunt. And if you, if you kill early or if you're able to tag on more days at the end of your hunt, I'm telling you, those days that you have just being out in those woods, just focusing on, on being able to observe and to find elk sign and trying to and continue looking for elk are, I mean, those are days. Think about this. You're just most putting guys, data in your data bank early yeah, enough. Yeah, right. totally. Because Try most guys least. go out and let's say they hunt five days a year, right? Let's say they take five days a year. Well, dude, man, if you hunt five days a year, it's going to take you, uh, man, you're, you're looking at how many years does it take you to get a one month of education, right? Thanks. Right. Mm -hmm. Six years to get one month of education. So for every day that you're able to tag on to that, you're improving that database there. And, and I'll tell you, man, if you get done with a hunt and you're thinking, oh, I get to go home. It's generally somebody that's really not wanting to. Now, look, we all have reasons sometimes we got to get home. Forget yeah. that. That's what I'm talking about. But if you have that opportunity, uh, it's people that just aren't really concerned on improving that. And, you know, that kind of stuff, learning um, how to use animal trails, uh, learning to pay attention to the sun, moves, and stars, prevailing winds when you're out there, learning to combine that with how the animals are actually moving and the effect the sun, moon, and stars have on them. All of that is stuff that ties in to creating your elksmanship, man. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you another thing when you learn that is what I call energy efficiency. And Manano and I were talking about this the other day. And he said, you know, Joe, you know, and uh, he said, we we hiked way back into this area and we're, we're back there. And, and it's like uh, we hadn't heard anything yet that morning. And I think it was like uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. And and I'm like, man, we're back here. You know, we should be hunting. And, and you turned around, and you said, let's take a nap. And, and he's like, why are we taking a nap? And I was like, that's what the animals are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it, you want to eat when they're eating. You want to move when they're moving. You want to sleep when they're sleeping. And mm -hmm. so if you do that, that helps you with that energy efficiency. You're not just stumbling around in the woods. You become you become part of the flow, not just yep. somebody that and is blown. That's an excellent point, Joe. Another thing uh, is that when, when you go out there to the woods and, and, and you just take the time to kind of be out there for, for several hours, you get to know your body better. And you need you get to understand you know your your water mm. needs your food needs and all that stuff and and it just helps you kind of you know get a better pace uh, for when you're out there and and it's like it's like kind of your energy bank like you're saying when you're out there you know how yeah. much energy you got left in your bank and you know how to pace it out and you know you make decisions out on the wood based on you know what you know you got left. Ha, ha, yeah. You know, having yeah, that energy efficiency tank. and knowing when to go and blow is critical, man, mm -hmm. because that animal is just like that. You know, they are they have to be masters at energy efficiency because they have to survive a rut and a winter and 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 still uh, make it through. So, yeah. you know, they're going to do certain things at certain times. You know that you can actually do the same things with them. Okay. Yeah. And when you so, understand moon phase, Joe, that can really help you a lot. Right. Uh, I, I took Logan fishing last weekend and we were in the middle of a moon phase where it was high. And the moon was going to be high all day in the middle of the day. Uh -huh. And I told him, I said, look, you know, we, we launched at about, I don't know, nine or 10 o'clock, I think in the afternoon, uh, wanted to, to get out a little later and I knew the moon was going to be for us. As soon as that moon got up at 11 o'clock, I told him, I said, we're fixing to murder these fish. And right. he's like, how do you know that? I said, cause I'm telling you the moon never lies when it moves above head or below foot, the fish are always going to feed. And that's just part of, 
I don't know, the gravitational pull. I don't know what really right, spurs them right. into feeding. But it's the same thing with elk and deer. Uh, we they're, smashed they're, them from the, 11 to 4 o'clock. Yeah, the time that they're going to be more active, right? Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, we murdered them. And he, he asked me that. He said, how did you know that? I said, you know, my grandpa taught me that a long time ago when I was a young man. And Gilbert, there's, there's an app for that now, right? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. So, there is an app for that. Yeah. So let, let's uh let's go to our 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 next area in this section, and, and that's elk zone preparation. And we explained that before is that their comfort zone is different for us. So you really have to invest in um, the following areas and changing your comfort zone, going outside your comfort zone. Let's for the first area, for example, I'll talk about in shooting. You know, I mean man, we're all our greatest heroes in the backyard. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? We're yeah. standing there. We got great conditions and we're kind of like, oh, I'm not going to go out and shoot out there, man. It's got a little Southwest breeze. That's going to blow. You know, I, I want to be popping them aces out there. So, uh, you know, we go out in the best condition, standing in the best form. Uh, and, and look, form is critical to learn, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have your form down, uh, you have to learn to do things like, I'll give you a great example, like Luis did this year where, you know, he's in form and all of a sudden he steps out with his lead foot. He takes and steps his left foot out, uh, out past his right foot to be able to step out and he keeps his form to be able to get that shot on that bull, you know, because he had to come around a tree. He, that That's a move that I don't think he would have made three years ago, man. I did the same thing. Had to take at full draw, had to take a full step around right. at full draw. I mean, that's just stuff that I practice here in the backyard, but didn't do it didn't do it at first, right? But I practice yep. it here all the time in the backyard. If you from are my knees, from if wherever. You're not, yeah, uh, on your knees and where else? What else? Yeah, standing, shooting us on the, having to lean out, shoot beside a bush. You know, uh, we shoot from our knees. I put a really thin window of trash cans and everything I got to shoot down the middle of, right? right. So, I mean, if I got to thread it through there, I, I believe that I can do it if I can see the kill zone. I know right. that I, if I, I put something in front of the target that's 20 yards in front of it and I got a 50 yard shot, I shoot right over the top of it, you know, uh, but <laughs> those are the things that we practice. We just don't stand out there and practice like we do if we're standing in the middle of the bow zone. Right? Chav and I used to take a, a, a judo point or a blunt and we used to play horse where we would create different shots in different areas uh, and, and, you know, see who could make that shot. And <laughs> we, uh, I did one where I got up in the crotch of a tree and shot down at this thing through all this stuff. And, and, uh, and Chaz a little shorter than I am. So, uh, he gets up in the crotch of this tree and because he's so short, there's a tree branch that's in his way. He can't shoot. And it's kind of unfair because I could see over it. Right. So <laughs> I get underneath of him and I take this little sapling and I push it to the side and he's up above me. And, and I know his <laughs> bow is just right up there behind me and I'm holding that tree. You remember this, right? Chad? Huh? Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm holding this tree and in my mind, just, you know, I hear him draw back. And as soon as I heard him draw back, the first thing that was in my mind was, I sure hope you don't shoot me in the back of the head. <laughs> 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 and all of a sudden, dude, that that's when those, uh, uh, when the cams were those egg shaped cams yes. and they would pull up just like that. And then, and they'd fly down to get that good snap like that. Uh... Well, the bo his bottom cam went up just like that above my head. And when he let go and that bow arm dropped, that frigging cam chopped me in the top of the head. In the back. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought he just shot me in the back. Of my head. <laughs> That's gotta I hurt. Dude, I bled like a stuck pig, man. Like, he split oh, my scalp I up. I bet he felt horrible. I bet oh, he, um, I thought he shot me in the head. I was like, he shot oh. me in the head, man. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, I was, meanwhile, I was like, what happened? My arrow didn't go right. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah, that cam went down. He's concerned the about the, the shot. Who cares if I hit go? Yeah. 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 I was like, screw uh. your head. My shot was off, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah. You should see his face when he dry fired that bow at that bull, man. It was like a, a amazement. Oh. 
Oh, and he looked at me like, what in the world was that? He's like, oh, <laughs> you know, I'll never forget it. And the arrow went, boop. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Just but, some of the things that happens to us out there, man. Oh, it's totally. And, and, you know, not only the different angles, you know, wearing your gear, right? Wearing yeah. your gear that you're going to hunt in. But also, here's one I'm going to throw out, man. Y'all, if you got mosquitoes out there, go shoot. <laughs> Put all the crap on to keep the mosquitoes off of you, just like you would that you're out there, and go shoot. If it's hotter than heck, go shoot. If it's cold and windy, go shoot, man. If it's drizzling outside, go shoot. Put yourself in the most uncomfortable position and conditions as you can, all right? And, you know, uh, for for your physical fitness, and Gilbert, you, you hit on this before, man, and Guys, prepare for the suck, man. I mean, you know, uh, we we all hike and we do things like that. You know, find some stuff that you look at and you go, man, I don't want to do that and do it. You know, put put some weight in the pack, go after it and do it. Uh, do some burpees because they friggin' suck, man. They just I hate them. <laughs> they, they, do they get things out of you but I'll tell you what joe i ain't burping when i'm taking getting after an elk brother <laughs> i might be throwing up but i ain't burping <laughs> well i tell you what i remember looking at some guys when we were doing about the third trip up that one hill last year oh, third or dude. fourth trip the and everybody's same like one they were like, again, man? Oh, man, you know? they just kept sounding off up there. Yeah. I remember, I remember um, me and Brandon were in but chat. But the, the physical conditioning, it's super important, Joe. And, oh. and look, you know, if I compare uh, just the way I felt um, last year versus the year before, oh, yeah. to me it was, you know, incredible difference. And um, it just took me training for six months prior to the hunt, you know. Right. And so – uh, it does make a difference. It makes you feel better. I mean, it's not like it's it's going to be easy because it, it never is, but it's going to it's going to make it more tolerable. Uh, your body's going to respond better. You're going to have less cramps, and and you're going to yeah. be able to kind of you know you're, uh, you're going to recover faster. That's you're right. going to be able to get up in the morning. Um, there's still going to be times when you're stiff as crap. Your body just got to get. I mean, I can just tell you this, man. Um, <sighs> depending on where you're at, but there's places I've seen that, that, uh, you know, when we've gone up to Wyoming and different places that, you know, the footing, uh, you're stepping on something around something every time, man. And, Over uh, something. you know, mm-hmm. areas that we hunt, man, it's like, it's, it's moving ground all the time, man. You got lava rock and everything like that. So, you know, prepare, prepare for that kind of stuff. You challenge yourself put yourself in situational conditions find a way when you hike to change the terrain you hike in change the time of day you get up man i mean just go ahead and set that alarm clock a couple of days at 3 a.m in the morning change your comfort zone get used to doing things out of the ordinary and it doesn't play with your head so much when you're out there and this doesn't cost you anything other than focus time and energy but if you invest that focus and that time and energy in those, it pays huge dividends when you get there, man. So uh, that's that's pretty much uh, the things that we wanted to talk about in elk zone preparation, understanding that when you go into that animal's environment, that is their home. And the more comfortable you can make yourself in their situation, because you're never going to be able to, I mean, if that guy wants to go up a hill, there ain't no way you're going to follow it. Ain't no way. Not at his speed. No, Mm. not if they decide to get going, right? (laughs) Incredible athletes. Might as well throw a rope and hang on. But but if you're in situations where you've got to get up and down on some of those from a bedding area or to to beat them to a particular area when they're taking their time or you're trying to catch up to them because they're sounding off in an area that – I can tell you what, Gilbert Ornelas – uh, about six years ago, I think it's six years, Gilbert, when we did this thing called the shoot every oh. daggone morning, man, because we would start out in a bottom meadow and there was a canyon that went up to an upper meadow. And either those critters are going to be in the bottom meadow or they're going to be in the upper one. Well, it just so happened just about every day except for one, they were all in that upper one. And man, we would hit that 
that canyon getting up there because it was you know taking the steep part was was a whole lot faster than going on around the easy way and man i tell you what i mean gilbert at that time you had to have been i don't know uh what your weight was at that 320 time. yeah it, it was yeah. tough i mean but uh but we got her done, man, you know, so. We do. Joe's a, a master at trying to fit everything to to your capabilities. But I can just tell you that, you know, the last two and three years, you know, when I've showed up to elk camp, I've been in a lot better shape. And, oh, definitely. And can, you know, if I need to go, I can go. So yep. uh, it, it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, <laughs> I, and, and look, I make up for it. If you can get me within 60 to 80 yards of an animal, he's in serious trouble, but guys, I'm telling you, it's a whole lot better taking that 30 yard shot. <laughs> I did it. This is the first year that I killed an elk in under 48 yards in my career. And I shot him at 38, I believe. So that was like a layup. <laughs> if there are any guys out there that struggle getting outside of your comfort zone i want to tell you like that boy that was just talking right there that's gone from three and a quarter down to 250 some pounds man and and uh and i have uh my brother right there leroy chavis that um you know couldn't even take a step and told me at that time put me in for the elk draw you know and this is a guy that that uh, I watch. Um, Thank you, guys. <laughs> you talk about going out of your comfort zone, man. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, this guy is daily <clears throat> uh, trying to teach his body to do things that he did when he was two years old. Sure. And uh, he's drawn his elk tag. He's made that his goal to be up in the mountains. He's working three times a day and ain't none of it comfortable. And I know that there's that every day is a friggin' grind and a friggin' struggle. And, and he's given it everything he has at 68 years of age with not a single bit of quit in him. So if, if you're struggling with your comfort zone, Suck it the heck up, man. And if you want to do this and you really want to go after these guys and you want to make it something special, um, understand that you can do this and there's no reason why you're not able to. And that thing that is uncomfortable now, you can whip the crap out of it. Okay. So I'm just telling you that. Um, uh, guys, any thoughts mm -hmm. before we go into our EBD here? Mm -mm. No, it's all good stuff, Joe. Awesome, man. Uh, bro, I'm just so proud of you, Chav. And, and We all are. I man, mean, daily I, I, inspiration for all of us. I cannot wait. I, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. Uh, you know, I take video of him all the time. You guys know I share it with you all the time. And something new that, that he does. And, 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 man, I tell you what, there's... There's days I just want to jump up and 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 squeeze the friggin' life out of him. I'm so proud of him, you know. So, uh, um, <laughs> so anyway, let's uh, let's head to our EBD series. And uh, and what I want to talk about here now is I want to talk about an elk's daytime behaviors. Just so that some of you guys that don't have that elk database, this is just information. It might be old news. It might be new news. It might be a little nugget in this, but I just want you to understand what these animals are doing during the day. Because if you know, number one, and we're going to cover that, that these critters spend pretty much 80% of their day in a bedroom, then, then, you, then you know something. But what about where they're at and when they're getting there? Because, man, I tell you, if you understand this, then you understand that you don't have to necessarily wait for them in the bedroom to get there, and you don't have to wait for them in a park to be able to hunt them. Because uh, elk are feeding in nighttime feeding areas where they know that they're safe. They're out in the open, and that's where the best <clears throat> grass is, and they're going to get the most protein. And under darkness, they feel like in darkness like they do when they're in cover, all right? They're going to be someplace where they have cover around them, but they're going to be out in those open areas that they can see and they can smell predators around there. That's where they feel safe uh, in, in those in those open uh, areas to feed at, at night. And that's where you're going to find them in the morning. And depending again, like we've talked about, whether it's a full moon, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether you have rain shadow in the moon, is how it's going to keep them longer in those areas. But as daylight comes up, 
and especially if they're feeling pressure that they're being hunted, that those critters are going to go from, as that daylight comes up again, they need that security, so they're going to head into the trees. So at daylight, they're going to move back into the security of cover. And I can tell you, um, I don't know if you're new to this, you might not have heard this, but as you get into hunting elk more and more, you're going to hear a bull man that's just going to be screaming, man. He's just like bugles. And then he bugles. And then he's bugles. And you're like, your first reaction is, oh, man, that bull's hot, man. He's screaming. He's going off. And you scream a, 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 a challenge bugle at him when really all that is is you haven't paid attention to the time of the day. It's either like 730. It's like 7 o'clock. And what's happening is that bull is actually has hit the trees with his cows, with his harem, and now he is sounding off as he's going to a destination just so that his cows knows where he's at and so that any other cows in the area know he's there. He's advertising so that they can come into them. So uh, understand that when you hear that at that time in the morning, that is a bull going to a destination that is pretty much singing that tune just so that his cows and other cows knows where he's going. He is not challenging anything. He's just strictly advertising and keeping things together as he's going. All right. But also yep. understand this, as you hearing him go, he ain't the one in the lead. That's right. Right. Who's in the lead? That lead now, cow. Yeah. That lead cow man is taken, you know, he is actually going to be the last one into the trees, man. Uh, those cows are going to go off and they're going to go start heading to his bed, to their bed, and he's going to follow them up. And that's why as he's on the rear, he is singing so that they know where he's at and so that other cows that might have been in the area can join that up, all right? Now, once they get in the trees, those critters are going to slow down. They're going to be outside in that park, and there's going to be a certain time when, man, they're going to get in the trees. And I've told people this. Let's say you're rifle hunting, and you come driving around uh, uh, on a vehicle, or you come around walking uh, on your feet, and you come around into a park, and you look up, and all of a sudden a bull sees you and turns and starts heading for the tree line. Well, let me tell you what. Lock and load, get your scope up, and look at that tree line where that animal's going because as soon as they hit the trees, they're going to be 10 to 20 yards in those trees, and they're going to stop, and they're going to broadside. And turn around. And they're around. going to check. Yeah. Yep. They're going to check. Where and there's a lot of times if you've got a cow call with you, you can hit a cow call, and they'll stop and Before turn they broadside. Get there. Yep. Yeah, but way before they get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. you can catch him in mid break and yeah, and man, I've they stop and they'll turn broadside and look yep. straight at you. But if if there are critters that have gone from a park into the trees, once they hit it, they're going to slow down. And think about why they slow down. Always ask yourself, why are animals doing this? Because there's a couple reasons. Once they get in the trees, they don't see as good either. They got to check for danger. They're checking their nose. They're looking ahead. They're letting that lead cow do her job. Them back ones are looking behind them, making sure that nothing is following them, checking where that bull is. And they're going to slow down, and they're going to meander through that to their destination. And they're going to they're going to find areas that either got like water on the way or they got good feed and they're going to go through those what I call corridors uh, that have good browse, good grasses, good forbs between there and their bedding area. So that's why I'm telling you that a lot of times it ain't going to be in the parks, y'all, if you're bow hunting where you're going to kill an animal. It's going to be in the trees. So if you see if you see elk out in a park, watch those cows look at where those cows are tending to lean to go into the trees because now you want to get around and get to that location forget about them being in the park go in and parallel them in the trees because that's where they're going um they they want to be in those areas man if there's if, if they're heading from there to the bed and there's a burn anywhere in there or if there's places where it's kind of dispersed as far as the canopy goes where the grass gets good nutrients um they're going to they're going to hit those areas before they get to their bedding areas. Those are prime time areas to catch a bull uh, that's working in that timber in there. Okay. So um, I call those transition corridors. And, you know, for example, guys say, well, the elk didn't come out into the park until the last 15 minutes of daylight. Well, if that's happening, don't be hunting the park. Hunt the transition from that bedding area to the park in those areas where they can feed, man. Uh, as it starts to get shadier 
they're going to go into those spots because where they're betting at is thick and dark. There ain't nothing to eat. Yeah. Ain't nothing in there, right? Yeah, that dark timber doesn't have nothing growing under it. Ain't nothing dark. in there, man, like friggin' soft dirt. That's why yeah. you can travel through it so quiet, right? Yeah. Um, so elk are going to spend most of their day in there, but guys, once those guys are bedded, bulls will use, especially in the rut, and that's when they're going to be with them, they're going to use that as an opportunity because, man, he's just been following his cows everywhere. He's been keeping other guys off. He's been tending them out in the park all that time, eating when he can. But most of the time, he's working, man. He's yeah. like a working fool. So once they get in the bed, that's his opportunity to go off and get some water, go off and get some feed if he can. So that is a hot time to get a bull, man, <clears throat> right in there. And uh, understand those animals now from their bed, those guys are masters at using wind and thermals. They know how to survive, and they're going to use them in their favor and at a certain time in the afternoon. And that time is dynamic. Chav, what time was it when we saw that bull with his cows come down into that watering hole? Oh, that was probably 1 o'clock, you know, 95 degrees. And he traveled a long way to get to that water hole. Long way from uh, the bedding area. Yeah, right? there was a, a big burn, uh, probably a what, half mile long or even a right. mile long before you hit any any type of uh, forest of any kind. Or thick timber. Or, yeah, so uh, he traveled a long way just to get to that water hole. Now, there could have been mitigating circumstances, y'all. I mean, there could have been another hunter bumped them out of their bed, and that's why they got there earlier. We don't know. I mean, there could be a lot of reasons, but it was 1 o'clock. And I know Carl Gamage used to put out uh, on his property, which was private property, and they're getting uh, cows and a bull on on the camera, on a trail cam, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <clears throat> you know, they're, they're out there. Uh, Especially close to water. Yeah, mm -hmm. especially close to water. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes those cows, if it's hot, will get up and they'll drink. If it's not, that bull will definitely go to those areas that are close and, and catch a drink, man. So Yeah, and they like to water, too. Yes, absolutely. And so it's, it's, it's dynamic in that time that they go. But once they have the thermals in control or know that they have to be to a certain area before those thermals switch to protect themselves, they start moving back towards the feeding grand, grounds. And that's when... Uh, they're going to take advantage of hitting water along the way. And again, they're going to meander through those transition feeding areas, those transition corridors before they ever get to the parks. And for you as a bow hunter, that's the place you want to be. As a rifle hunter, you got that last 15 minutes of legal shooting time before they get out, unless you can recognize where those corridors are and, and be in a position, in a high level position where you can see them moving through that thick stuff. And, and to me, that gives you a lot longer hunt when you can do that. Hey, Joe, I, I think I find everything you just said as far as, um, you know, the park uh, during the night while feeding, feeling protected, then the second phase will be going back up, you know, through the transition corridors and, you know, then getting into the bedding area way, where they feel most secure and they, they know the area better. And now you know, in the afternoons, going back through the transition zones, corridors to get back to the open when it gets dark. I mean, that was great for me to visualize. It was a perfect way for me to understand the, their daily cycle right. um, and, and, and the reason and why they do it that way. So I just wanted to say, man, that was, that was spot on. I learned something like in, a, in an awesome way today. I think and you I put it out sure perfectly. I want to make sure people don't confuse that they're going back and forth to the same place either. Right, right. You know, these guys know their country, mm -hmm. and they know that, and, and they're smart. They don't eat themselves out of a home. So, mm -hmm. you know, after they yeah, fed in one place, mm -hmm. yeah. If they realize and, and they're safe and they're not feeling any pressure, they will a lot of times go to some of the same areas. We've seen that time and again. Yeah. But if they're feeling pressure in an area, they know where other grass is going to be where other bedding areas that they want to be to in other transition corridors. Yeah. But well, and they're vocal too. They hear the other animals talking. Sure. So, you know, they can go investigate wherever the other ones are talking. Right. 
So I, that's uh, that's our EBD series for today, and and that's going to conclude today's show. We've got uh, we're going to do one more session of this uh, next week. Um, we're going to uh, well, in this series we're going to talk about investing in your attitude, confidence, and mental strength. Ooh, that's going to be good. You know, guys, like we always say, if you like what we're doing here at Elk Bros, please subscribe, rate, and review. You have to go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes to review us, and uh, you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And, uh, you know, a reminder of our listeners, we'd love for you to send your questions in. Please send questions, y'all. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to answer them on the show. Just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. Another fantastic show from uh, from all of us today, Joe. Exquisite content that our, our do-it-yourself guys are going to get a leg up if they start doing these things. And uh, we've talked about we'll have another segment to go next week. You know, guys, we want everybody to stay safe and uh, practice their social distancing still as we move through this new norm of our lives. And, you know, like I always say, husbands, fist bump your wives, wives, fist bump your husbands, uh, you know, kind of pat your babies on the head and keep your broad <laughs> head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Guys, it was good seeing all of y'all. Good to see y'all. Peace. Peace. Peace, peace, y'all.